Let's wait a few more minutes. Um, I suggest we start. So thank you for joining this afternoon for the Competence Center and Thematic Services session. My name is Gerge Shiposh. I work at the EGI Foundation and I chair this session together with Deborah Testi from Chineka. Um, let me start with a very short introduction to these concepts of thematic services and competence centers because these are terms that we use in the ESC Hub project and before we have the real presentations, I would like to ensure that everybody in the audience is familiar what we mean by them. Um, this slide provides an overview and positioning of the thematic services and competence centers in the EOSC landscape. And particularly it shows work packages of EOSC hub that are, that are responsible for various activities. You can see on this right side of the slide with these orange boxes that there are some basic infrastructure services that the project delivers. And thematic services are basically community specific online services that are integrated with some of these basic generic functionalities in order to serve scientific users. This happens typically through the EOS portal where these thematic services are made available and accessible for the scientists. The competence centers are, can be considered as kind of incubators of new services. Competence centers are small project type activities with multiple partners involved who co-design and put into production new services for certain scientific communities. They also rely on the generic services and do this integrational and co-design work in collaboration with the providers of these generic services. We have additional similar activities which are not covered today, or at least not in this session. We have a parallel session right now about the early adopter pilots, which are doing a very similar activity, but these early adopters have been selected during the project, around half time in the project. Meanwhile, competence centers and thematic services have been in the consortium since the beginning. And if you look at the practicalities of who are these competence centers and thematic services and all also early adopters, then you, you can see the, the disciplinary distribution on this uh, pie chart. You can see that earth science and environmental science dominates, but we have a good representation of physics, life sciences in, and uh, social sciences, humanities, and other um, more multidisciplinary uh, collaborations too. You can also see that many of these competence centers and thematic services link to S3 research infrastructures or multinational projects, typically from Horizon 2020. And today we have presentations from five of these competence centers and thematic services. The first talk will be given by Annabella about open cost, which is a service for ocean circulation forecasting. Then Daniela Spiga will talk about the dynamic on-demand energy service, which was initially for high energy physics, but then was picked up by other disciplines. Then Johannes will talk about um, how certain workflows have been integrated uh, from the ecosystem modeling, long-term ecosystem modeling community. Then Andrew will talk about fusion physics and the tool that they and the service they developed to manage compute intensive uh, analytics. And last but not least, Ingemar from the ASCAS community will talk about the data portal and the infrastructure they put in place for atmospheric uh, research. So after a short introduction, I would like to invite Annabella to share her screen and to start the presentations. I encourage the audience to ask questions in the chat window. We will pick up those questions after each of the presentations. 
Uh, Gergely, sorry, Deborah here. Just for the attendees, if they would like to make their question loud after the speaker has ended mm -hmm. this talk, they can just raise their hand and we can give them the word after each right. talk. Okay. Just as another option with respect to the chat. Right, right. Okay. We can see the slides, Annabella. Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Annabelle Oliveira and I'm a researcher at the National Laboratory for Civil Engineering in Lisbon. And today I'm going to show you how Open Coast, an EOS service for on demand forecasts, is faring. Uh, this is a work developed by LNEC in collaboration with LIP from Portugal, CNRS La Rochelle from France, and the University of Cantabria in Spain. So what is Open Coast? Open Coast is a user-friendly web interface where you can implement forecast systems for your coastal site uh, of choice. And by doing these, we generate the daily forecasts of several variables, depending on the physics that you select. So we have water levels, wave parameters, 2D and 3D velocities, and 3D salinities and temperatures. All, all of this is provided for a, a time frame of 24 hours of forecasting based on the use of the numerical model schism that addresses all relevant physical processes. So open coast, what are its main features? So it's very flexible in the, in the sense of the physics that you select. You can select a 2D barotropic, 3D baroclinic, 2D wave and current circulation uh, deployments. It's very flexible on the forcing that you use to, to force your model on the boundary conditions, and also to, to specify some of the key parameters in the skills models. Also, Open Coast is not just a, a tool to set up forecast systems. It also allows you to do multiple actions over them. You can uh, stop, uh, start, uh, clone the systems, and also look at the results through a viewer. Finally, and most importantly, Open Coast is a service that is fully integrated with your service, as you will see in the next slides. So let's look at what is open coast from the point of view of the user. It is a web interface that is composed of three main building blocks, the configuration assistant, the wizard, sorry, the forecast manager and the output viewer. In the first one, you can build a forecast deployment step by step in a very friendly way. Then you have a forecast manager where you manage all the forecasts that you have started. You can start to check the details of what is inside each simulation, clone the forecast, start, stop, and even delete the forecast if you are no longer interested. Finally, because modeling is not useful if you cannot look at the results, we have an output viewer where you can visualize the results, add data and model points on the fly to check the results in specific locations, and download the time series at those locations and the model output to your PC. Finally, if we have several deployments running at the same time, there is a way also to compare time series from the several deployments, for instance, for a sa the same system. All of this is available at the site that you see on the screen, and uh, it's free of use, uh, just upon a very simple registration. Okay, let's look at the insides of Open Coast. So Open Coast is composed with the back end and the front end. Front end is where the user interacts. And uh, all of this is composed of a set of subservices uh, that have uh, associated apps and uh, storage platforms. And all of these parts are using a number of uh, uh, EOS Cub uh, core services. For instance, we use HGI check-in for the user authentication. We use the, the cloud computing services to provide the computer resources to run the backend. We also use compute, uh, containers using UDocker to set the right environment and also high throughput computing resources to run also simulations and to store the data. Finally, we use HGI workload manager for the job, job submission. Now from the computational part to the physics part. So what is inside open cost in terms of options for the deployment setup? So we have for the ocean, we have FAST 2014 that addresses tides. We have two deployments of CMEMS, both the world CMEMS and the EB deployment to force boundary conditions. And then we have two national products, which is PRISM 2017 for the storm surge effects plus tides, and also a deployment of Wave Watch, wave watch 3 to set up forcing wave conditions over the North Atlantic. 
as far as the atmosphere goes, we have both GFS from NOAA and ARPEDS from Meteor Funds uh, to set up the atmospheric conditions in our simulations. Uh, these simulations have a way to compare with data and we have a, a very strong link with the ModNet data where the user can look at the data and the result of the forecast inside the platform. Finally, what we require from the user, it, uh, he or she only needs a computational grid of their coastal system of choice, uh, has the ability to set up the parameters of the modeling, and thus to specify, if applicable, the river flow that is imposing in its freshwater uh, boundaries. Finally, Open Coast is composed of a device running model schism that is integrated in a forecast platform the water information forecast framework. And finally, all of this is embedded within the open coast platform. So where do we start and then where are we now? We, we started at the beginning of the project uh, in January 2018. And after five months, we already had the system integrated with some EOS services and already uh, running operationally and available to the users. It only addressed the possibility to do, to do to the barotropic deployments. As the users uh, required more complex physics, we then introduced the 3D bar clinic simulations that was available for the use in September 2019. And finally, this summer, we introduced the final uh, part of the, the modeling suite, which is the 2D waves and currents uh, forecast deployments. So where are we now at the new version of Open Coast version 2? It is already available for the users for testing and using it since last July. And uh, where are we going to go from here? Uh, we want to make open code as open software. So we are going to open the code to everyone, put it in an open repository, and all of it is going to be done by, by March next year. In terms of scientific outputs, we have published a paper on the open coast concept uh, with some key applications that was published last year in the environmental modeling and software. And we are now preparing a new paper for coastal dynamics with the full service. You are probably now thinking, why, why is this necessary? Who are our users? So open codes address social, social tall needs in the sense that can support the daily and the long-term management of coastal water bodies. It can be used to anticipate contamination events, it support emergency actions, also to be used on a daily basis to support the water economy related to the coast daily tasks, and also for the public uh, to be used uh, to help uh, define uh, leisure and recreation times, for instance. Finally, forecast systems run every day and all of the results are stored. So in time, we get a very rich uh, database of water conditions in each particular system of choice. And these can also be used for long-term management purposes, such as risk management. So basically, our users are coastal management, port and water authorities, coastal related businesses and general public. We also have a very large community uh, of users, which are the coast research community. And let me just give you a, a brief over, overview of what, what are the uses that people are do, uh, doing with Open Coast. Open Coast is very flexible to help people understand uh, physical processes and to define modeling choices. And I'd like just to show you a very brief example from our team that was the following. We had to, to, to model the albufeira south of Portugal coastal circulation, and that we didn't know as we didn't know the system, which was the best modeling approach. So we set up two different open cost deployments, one for 3D baroclinic runs and the other one to 2D wave and current interactions. And we have it running for some time. So we got a lot of mild atmospheric conditions. And from that, we saw that the two different simulations led to very different velocity fields. As we want to use these to force contamination plumes, this means that the, the choice would have very strong impacts. Then we got lucky 
and we got uh, bad weather conditions. The pressure in Barbara last, last month uh, showed up with the winds up to 80 kilometers per hour and very heavy rain, so very strong atmospheric conditions. And we saw that now that the, the velocities are not that different in the magnitude for the two simulations, but the direction remains very different. So that helped us to set up that we had to go to a combined uh, modeling choice that included 3D baroclinic and waves and currents. Another way that uh, the, the research community is using uh, open coast is to set up a fast schism model deployment. So we have a new system. Uh, we don't have never used the model there and using open coast, even someone without a lot of experience with the schism model can very quickly set up uh, a modeling suite running and getting results. So this is our two of the examples that our research community is using open coasts. Now let's look at impact. Over these almost two years, uh, actually three years, uh, open coast has been uh, started to be used all over the world. In this map, you'll see uh, where our users are located. By the way, the numbers on the, the, the red dots are not users, are the, the, the order by which that user in that country started using open coasts. So we have around 250 users from 39 countries and about 300 deployments. And uh, these 300 deployments are scattered through the whole five continents. So what really helped us to, to, to get all of these people interested in using this service? In the scope of Ewoscab, we, we run three training events, uh, hands-on, uh, in person, remote, uh, that uh, has had about 250 trainees. And this was a very important way to get our, our service out there in the community. So where are we going from now? What are our plans beyond the, the end of the OSCA project? We are going to continue to expand the open coast features, in particular through the new project AGIS. We are going to integrate INTCAST, so the ability to run the past, not only to forecast, and also to forecast water quality, in particular for fecal contamination. Uh, in the scope of the Eosk Synergy project that is already running and is going to, to go through the next year, we are going to integrate the possibility to compare with our observation data. And finally, in the scope of several nationally funded projects, we are going to integrate the possibility to, do, to run 3D wave and current interaction, to introduce the sediments in the forecast mode, and to run 2D morphodynamic simulations. And finally, also to introduce a new model, XBeach, to address the specifics of beach hydrodynamics. Uh, another important project for us for the future is to start to have an open coast development community. This takes a lot of time to build this, all of these things. And we have uh, some people that were, are interested in working with us in the development part. So we are improving the documentation in order for that to be possible. We are helping other people to build their own open coast instances so people can develop, develop in their own environment. And finally, we are looking to co-develop and share uh, new features of this service. In the, in the future, we are not all, uh, also forgetting our users. So we want to continue to reach out to our user community, in particular to by providing on-demand premier user support, helping to set up the computational grid, helping to improve uh, specific deployments, and also to provide dedicated and zone tra training events for specific communities. Finally, as we are researchers, we are going to continue to do our dissemination, uh, not only by the new journal paper that we are preparing, but also by participating and disseminating open codes in several coastal sciences and engineering conferences. This is all I have for you. Thank you a lot for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. In the meantime, I have one question. On slide four, it says that about 300 deployments. What, what does it mean? What, what is a deployment here? Okay, a deployment is a use of open codes to set up a forecast system. Let's say I have um, three deployments of the North Atlantic. 
one with waves and currents in 2D, another one in 3D with baroclinic simulation. So deployment is a, an instance of open coasts that does forecasting of the circulation of a particular coastal site. But is it a software deployment on a particular computer? Uh, no, it's uh, an application of the service that runs okay. for a specific scene. It runs the model, runs model okay. schism for that system. Okay, let's say um, the North Sea. Mm -hmm. I set up a forecast for the North Sea. Uh, when I am putting in running mode, we now have a deployment for forecasting the circulation in the North Sea. Okay, I see. So it's okay. It's like a use case or, or simulation, okay. Or yeah, yeah, simulation or use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we know that the EGIA's project, which is not, yeah, yeah, it's mentioned, will start in January, so. Yes. So that's very soon. Any other question from the audience? I don't see a raised hand. So thank you. Annabel, um, and let's move on to the next speaker, Daniela Spiegel from INFN. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, see you. Okay, very, very good. I'm sharing uh, the screen. Right. Okay. Is it okay? Can you see? Yes, my full screen. Yes, full screen. Nice. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Daniel Espiga from INFN. I'm talking today about uh, the um, dynamic on-demand analysis service that we have integrated uh, within the EOS portfolio uh, within the EOSCAR project. Uh, and this is the outline of my of my talk. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction about the thematic service uh, and I uh, uh, will show you the, the, the genesis of the project and where it sits uh, uh, with respect to the original uh, community, uh, where it comes from. Then I will pass through through the uh, ambition of the project in a very nutshell, and then I will uh, uh, progress towards uh, uh, the progresses that we had uh, and, uh, the, and the, uh, a look at the future. So uh, the dynamic on-demand analysis service named DODAS uh, uh, is a platform as a service uh, uh, layers. Uh, and its main aim is to allow the um, uh, allow the user to to perform deployment of complex and intricate setups uh, in order to <clears throat> uh, to uh, to run uh, data science uh, uh, and data intensive uh, workflows. Uh, and uh, the key the key point is that uh, uh, the DODAS uh, platform aims to to automate uh, the whole process that the user need to perform in order to to um, to deploy a complete analysis system on top of uh, bare resources, uh, computing resources. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, this operation is meant to be uh, repeated over, uh, over the time, and the effort that you need to spend uh, to do that operation uh, uh, should be close to zero. So with uh, this aim, uh, we developed a system that is a container-based uh, uh, technical solution that uh, uh, in the end allow the user to uh, execute software, which uh, a software application, which can be uh, any analysis soft software spanning from a, a big data platform for heterogeneous data uh, up to the uh, batch system as a service. And of course, <clears throat> The system is also meant to, to allow uh, running and exploiting the machine learning techniques. So um, one thing that I uh, would like to, to, to remark since the beginning is that uh, is a very highly, uh, highly customizable uh, uh, solution uh, because in the end, uh, the aim, as I will come to this uh, later on, and the ambition is to, to build a, a system that is uh, um, uh, uh, adoptable by uh, many and different uh, communities and use cases. So uh, uh, it's based on the infrastructure as a code because uh, uh, the, the goal is that uh, we should have user and then uh, scientists focusing on how, uh, 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 how to implement the, the, the proper infrastructure and not, and not spending time and effort in uh, uh, 
um, uh, sorry, in what and not spending time in how to, to implement that. The, 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 the how should be automated by the underlying uh, uh, machinery. So the genesis of the thematic service uh, uh, is uh, um, uh, related to the, uh, the, the WLCG and the high energy physics uh, uh, community. And one of the, uh, the main experiment at CERN, the bigger experiment at CERN, which is the compact muon solenoid, CMS. So um, in that context, the vision is the, uh, of the evolution of the computing model is toward the system that is named uh, a data lake model that is summarized in the picture here on the right. And you see there are two layers, uh, roughly speaking, uh, the, 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 the upper one, which is related to the data management and the data based, the, the data related infrastructure, while the, the below one, the green uh, boxes represent the computing systems that uh, must join the uh, data uh, lake in order to process data. So the upper layer uh, has the, uh, the, the role to, to take and to, to manage data, while the below one has the role to, to process the data that are stored in the upper one. Where Doda sit in all of these uh, is uh, um, uh, shown by the two red arrow that you see uh, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the picture. So <clears throat> with this, pre with this uh, uh, in mind, the principle uh, um, that uh, um, drive the, the design of Doda's uh, um, are summarized here and in the end uh, uh, can be seen as a, um, uh, a solution uh, uh, in order to allow an effective use uh, of the uh, of any opportunistic resources, being it uh, uh, private or public, it doesn't matter, and uh, uh, to allow a dynamic extension uh, um, on an uh, on an existing facility towards something that can be a, a, a private or public clouds or a, an HP centers, uh, uh, it depends on the uh, the specific case. Um, not only, but the idea is that with such a solution, with such a technical implementation and service, uh, uh, we may be able to to allow to reduce uh, a community dedicated effort uh, um, that is uh, usually required uh, in order to manage uh, um, a community application on top of uh, a resource provider. And uh, uh, last but not least, of course, uh, um, one of the principles is that we should be able to enable user-friendly uh, procedures, uh, uh, as I told you, the, the automation and the uh, is a key pillars um, uh, in order to, to allow user to, to easily build a modern analysis facility wherever they uh, have resources and uh, in their uh, preferred provider. So um, again, uh, to close uh, where we are with respect to uh, our original community, that, that is again the compact muon solenoid uh, at CERN, this is a picture that uh, tells you um, uh, actually uh, how the uh, DODAS uh, service uh, is seen by the computing system of CMS. Uh, the, the, the picture show the three colors. Uh, the yellow one is uh, something that is specific to the experiment. It's a CMS workload management system. Uh, doesn't matter here, it's something a black box for us. But then uh, there is a layer in the picture, the gray one, which is uh, an HD condom, which is uh, an experiment free, uh, an experiment agnostic system that is uh, managing a, a pool of resources and uh, uh, payloads from uh, any, any type of uh, user. And then in the end, the, the, um, there is uh, what matter for us here, which is uh, the <coughs> actually, actually the uh, resources that uh, must be uh, available in order to execute the payloads. So the yellow prepare the payloads, payloads the green, uh, the gray distribute it and the, the, the green execute payloads. From the CMS perspective, uh, Dodas is a, a resource provider that can be a cloud and HPC, whatever, doesn't, doesn't uh, change the, the, uh, um, the concept, uh, but in the end is something that uh, uh, seamlessly uh, join the system and the, the complex system and uh, run the, uh, the payloads. So uh, the ambition of Dodas is summarized here. And uh, first of all, let me say that the vision uh, uh, from our perspective is best, uh, is represented by the inverted triangle that you see uh, um, uh, at, the uh, at the bottom of the, of the slides on the left, uh, where you see that uh, um, uh, it summarizes the concept that uh, the value uh, for the user in the end uh, is uh, at the upper layer of this triangle, where there is the uh, software, the software application, while the infrastructure <clears throat> 
is absolutely a key because without infrastructure nothing is possible here is not what the user need and want to, to see in order to exploit uh, the uh, uh, application and the solution Dodas allow is in the middle and allow to make to 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 implement this paradigm and uh, to, to, to cope with this vision. So uh, Dodas wants to provide a flexible uh, um, um, platform as a service level building blocks in order based on open industry, uh, open industry standards, of course, uh, in order to, <coughs> uh, um, to allow the exploitation of the uh, service compo composition model. What does it mean service compo composition should be clear uh, looking at the, uh, the picture on the right where you see many uh, known things uh, that can be composed. And in the end, the user with Dodas doesn't need to, to know nothing about that, just the fact that it wants some storage, some uh, Spark-based uh, um, uh, platform, a Jupyter Hub or Jupyter interface, uh, a base system uh, uh, as a service, uh, uh, anything like that. And uh, all the rest is automated and, uh, and managed by others. So uh, in terms of uh, achievement, and uh, um, there is a, a, a timeline here that represents what Dodas, where Dodas come from and where Dodas is going. So the two main information is that Dodas born around 2017, uh, uh, before the EOSCAP project, that then in 2018 became a thematic service of EOSCAP. If, if we look uh, at what's happening from here uh, up to now, you see that we had an evolution in terms of uh, community that has started uh, adopting Dodas as a solution in order to, to uh, process their data. And namely, namely, we have two success stories that are AMS uh, the, uh, um, and the uh, Fermi Lattice experiment, lattice experiment that is uh, today that are today in production. We have Virgo, um, which is in the pipeline, is still in work in progress. They are um, working in the integration. And uh, uh, in terms of resource providers, uh, uh, which was one of the our objective because we want to be uh, able to run on any infrastructure and in any pro, uh, resource provider. You see here the acronym and the, the uh, and the logos of what we uh, did uh, during the time. So where we are now and where we are going, you see that uh, we are start focusing on uh, closer integration with uh, um, the uh, data lake models as I introduced and as I will detail in a little while and uh, uh, with a close collaboration uh, um, with the escape uh, project uh, that you may have uh, heard about uh, and uh, in the um, for what regard the uh, CMS use case. Here we are talking about a CMS analysis facility looking at the future, the future of LHC which is actually the high luminosity LHC. 2027 on. And uh, regarding the DODAS uh, um, uh, future in terms of uh, participation of other projects, we, we will be supported by AGA uh, ACE project uh, starting uh, at the beginning of 2021. So uh, from another perspective, uh, uh, this is uh, how it looks like the trend of the uh, several KPIs uh, uh, that we, uh, we defined for the Dodas uh, um, thematic service. As you see there is a, a, a growing trends uh, in all of them. If you start from the um, bottom left, you have the resource usage of the uh, Dodas uh, dedicated resources uh, within the thematic service. This is an internal uh, um, uh, 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 logistic of the uh, EOS project, we have resources dedicated for the exploitation of the technical solution that I'm talking about. And you see here the two main dimensions that are CPU usage, usage and storage usage. Uh, both of them are growing and are um, growing toward the, uh, uh, the full, full utilization of uh, what we have uh, dedicated to the project again. Then uh, if you move to the right, you see on top uh, the uh, number of cluster deployments and the number of uh, uh, completed jobs, uh, uh, irrespective of the community that exists the jobs and you see here that for each of the reporting time uh, that of the EOSCA project, we have a growing trend. And the very same trend is, uh, is re reflected also in the, uh, uh, our capability on exploiting uh, providers uh, uh, on number of countries that are adopting uh, the, the, the service and the scientific communities and or use cases. This includes also use cases, distinct use, use, use cases. 
So uh, let's now move toward the end of my talk uh, and I will have a, a, a look, uh, give you a look at the future. So first of all, uh, we'll keep investing on the exploitation plan. Uh, for us, the exploitation plan means uh, to allow uh, communities and uh, scientific communities and user to adopt DODAS in order to, uh, to uh, accomplish their main scientific goal in terms of data processing. And you see here on the right, uh, um, there is uh, uh, some of the main achievements that we had in this respect during the past three years, more or less. And what we have on the, on the radar is on the left. On the left, you see that we are um, discussing, uh, from technical perspective, of course, uh, the uh, herd experiment uh, computing model, which will uh, adopt, uh, um, uh, we is evaluating to adopt DODAS as a, a main pillar for their uh, data processing flow. Uh, for what regard non high energy physics, we have contacts with uh, the heterogeneous data analysis projects. Uh, um, uh, oriented to the big data uh, use cases and approaches. Uh, and uh, uh, last but not least, uh, there is the exploitation of the data lakes, as I'm showing now here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, actually uh, one of the main pillars for the future uh, um, activity that we are foreseeing for the DOTAS project. So um, uh, now the data lake is a, a, a key, uh, a core uh, for many uh, um, data uh, intensive uh, science, uh, sciences and uh, uh, including our original community that is uh, again CMS uh, in, uh, in WLCG. On the left you see uh, uh, an high level view of what the data lake can be and few main um, uh, key elements of the, uh, of the data lake. Uh, if we look at the two, uh, at the two, uh, at the two one that uh, the two that I have uh, um, highlighted with the um, uh, violet color and the green color, you see that we have uh, the computing, uh, the data processing part, and the, and the data caches part. Okay, uh, so what DODAS does uh, um, in this context, uh, in, uh, in the context of the data lake, looking at the future, is to provide an embedded solution in order to build the computing part and the including the caching part part, which is a key aspect on the data lake uh, uh, infrastructure um, uh, design, uh, in order to uh, optimize the data processing and the data are supposed to be uh, uh, in the data lake. So there is a custodial uh, zone where the data are and the data is uh, who come here and provide you uh, uh, an all-in-one solution where you can analyze your data in the most effective way. And, uh, and uh, the few key points on what DODAS is meant to do in this context is to provide uh, from the infrastructure point of view, feature and capabilities like the auto scaling uh, in order to, to optimize the resource usages and uh, smart caching because this became a, a, a key aspect in order to in order to effectively process data, let's think to the uh, content delivery network approaches uh, and this kind of stuff. And uh, of course, the exploitation of, of uh, specialized hardware. Uh, the more uh, we focus on things like machine learning and so on, the more we want to, we want to access uh, 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 architecture like GPUs, uh, FPGA, and so on and so forth. Uh, from the uh, data analysis part, there is, of course, the possibility to run any non hep specific machine learning tools. So this is uh, something that will come and is coming with others in this context. So uh, the last dimension is the national one. Uh, uh, um, uh, in the high NFN context, uh, uh, there is a, a new board project that is delivering an high NFN national distributed infrastructure, high NFN cloud uh, as a national distributed infrastructure. Um, uh, the key pillars of the architecture are summarized here. And in the end, uh, we may uh, say that there is a, a foreseen backbone uh, spanning two main computing sites, as you see in the picture and a set of distributed federated cloud cloud that can be uh, connected and uh, um, uh, can come and go uh, uh, with respect the backbone and federate the backbone itself so in this very context is where dodas uh, has a role and uh, is indeed everything fully integrated dodas is a part of the portfolio of the infn cloud project 
So summarizing uh, what I have tried to, to, to show you today is the DODAS thematic service uh, um, that is providing a success, successfully providing support to several communities. Uh, uh, every uh, community that is supported is a data intensive uh, uh, one. Uh, we are keeping evolving uh, both from the techn techn technological perspective and of course we are trying to progress with the exploitation plan, uh, supporting new use case, new requirements and new communities. We have a well-established evolution plan toward a deeper integration with the data management and analysis toolkits because this is the, the future of the thematic set of, the, of a service like DODAS. And uh, we see DODAS as a suitable solution in order to bring uh, a cloud uh, and HPC compute to a data lake infrastructure. That's a very, a very important. And uh, um, uh, being uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, um, uh, experiment free and neutral, uh, DODAS can be easily adopted and integrated into uh, any, any other workflow. And we think we demonstrated it uh, in, the, in the real life. So, of course, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, available for any uh, consultancies and training. Uh, uh, and uh, please contact me, uh, as you see here, if there are uh, uh, specific requirements. Uh, I have done and, uh, with the material that I have prepared, so uh, any question is welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, any question? I don't see question in the chat window. I'll make a question in the meantime, then if someone else, uh, what they think, if they have questions. Um, Daniela, you mentioned that in one of the slides that uh, you've seen an increase, let's say, in uh, use cases or communities that uh, have been uh, uh, using DODAS. Um, can you comment a bit on the domain of these communities? Are they most of all from the same scientific domain or they cover different scientific domains? Well, uh, this is, uh, uh, okay, thanks for the question. Uh, the, 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 the main, uh, let me say, there is a common de denominator um, among the, the various community that is the, uh, the physics, uh, the physics, of course, uh, and uh, we span from astrophysics to the high energy physics. Those are the, 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 uh, the, the, the range that we, uh, that we span uh, as of today. And we have early uh, adopter, that, uh, as I, as I uh, referred in the, uh, in the slide where I showed the, the, what we have in the radar. Uh, there are, um, those are um, uh, multidisciplinary disciplinary uh, uh, communities, uh, uh, projects, sorry, where a few communities are trying to analyze uh, uh, heterogeneous data. Heterogeneous data for me means data that come from sensor, from, uh, um, from any um, uh, air pollution, so with respect to any, any societal related information, and they are trying to combine to make studies like that. So the main supported one belong to the physics, spanning from astroparticle up to the uh, high energy physics, but we are starting supporting multidisciplinary uh, uh, projects. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And did you receive those projects um, requested access through the YOSC portal? Well, um, the, the, the short answer is no. Uh, we have got one request at some point, uh, and then we have interacted offline for several reasons. I may not even be able to answer all the details about that, uh, but the, the, the main, the, the bulk of the request come uh, after uh, conferences, uh, training activities, and so mm -hmm. on. Right. So no, but uh, I, if I may allow, I, I would add that uh, the main concepts, uh, contact, sorry, come from after trainings. The the the, the mm -hmm. most relevant one uh, have been uh, uh, happened after our training. So training, mm -hmm. I think, is very important. Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't see other questions. Thank you very much. So Thank you. let's move on to the next speaker, to Johannes, who will speak about ecosystem modeling activities. Yes, we can see the slides. What you should, un yeah, we can see you. Not hear you yet. <laughs> Sorry also for unmuting uh, the microphone. Uh, so now bringing you on a on a bit uh, a different scale uh, of what we what we are doing. So integrating uh, specific 
uh, research with workflows um, on um, inducing USC uh, services. Uh, so what I'm uh, talking uh, to you and welcome to the to the presentation is about uh, cloud-based web service for outlier analysis for environmental time series. So that was uh, one specific uh, aspect uh, we selected for the for the Alta Competence Center. So my name is uh, Johannes Peterseil. I'm working for the Environment Agency in Austria, uh, which is also a member of the European uh, Long-Term Ecosystem Research Network, LTR, uh, in Europe and uh, the emerging infrastructure which is formed uh, about that. Uh, we are also forming uh, or being part of the information management team uh, of ELTA and also run uh, and maintain uh, a long-term monitoring site uh, in, in the Austrian Alps. So dealing with both aspects, uh, so the, the provision of data and also uh, the, 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 the management uh, of the data itself. So as part uh, of these activities, we are also involved in this digitization of the, of the research process along the whole data life cycle. And uh, this will also feed into the development of the ELTA information system in the upcoming year. So there's a, a new project, which is uh, a follow-up of the activities we are also doing in the USC Hub, uh, where the, this is used. So in this context, we are participating as competent center to the USC Hub project uh, in fostering the uptake of EOC services uh, in our user community, which is the, the LTR one. Uh, so what is the what is the the, the, the background uh, of what we are doing? So research infrastructure seek to seek to provide standardized uh, facilities, uh, resources, and services for specific research domains. So in our case, the LTR uh, research, uh, and this includes the use of long-term monitoring experimentation sites, uh, but also the provision of quality controlled data and data products. So ongoing digitization puts a focus on all different aspects across the whole data life cycle, ranging from the observation transformation to the publishing uh, of, the, uh, of the data. And in this context, um, at least in our community, cloud-based repositories for publishing and sharing the data are gaining uh, importance. For geo-reference time series, and that's a, a second important part, so coming from, uh, from sensor-based networks uh, installed uh, in, the, in the field, the OGC sensor observation services are rising importance. And that was also one of the, of the background for the work we are, we are doing. In our case, the, the data are coming from a wide range of different data providers participating in the data infrastructure. So there is a, a varying uh, way of doing it and being fed into central workflows for data and, uh, and analysis and integration. Considering the data provision from a wide range of participating sites, the issue of ensuring data quality is of high importance. This is not only true for the research infrastructure uh, itself, but also even more if we focus on the European scale also for the, for the European Open Science Cloud. So what is the, the, the context of the competence center we worked uh, for? So the European Research Infrastructure for Long-Term Ecosystem Critical Zone and Socio-Ecological Research, in short, L2RI, uh, which was recently put uh, on the S3 roadmap in 2019, aims to address key drivers of change of major European ecosystems and socio-ecological systems covering all different aspects of the life supporting systems. So coming from the atmosphere, uh, to biosphere down to the social and economic uh, sphere. It tackles the question on how global change, also now important uh, in the view of the pandemic, affects ecosystem, ecosystem processes, biodiversity, and uh, ecosystem services supporting uh, the, uh, the human society. So applying uh, monitoring and observation is focusing on a whole uh, on an integrated uh, whole system approach, so covering these uh, different aspects of the of the life supporting system, uh, and this addressing main ecosystem types uh, in Europe and this covering a broad biogeographic uh, range. Elta is long term, site based, multi scale, cross disciplinary, but also very heterogeneous, uh, and builds on about two hundred sites, uh, which is uh, comes out of a pool. Uh, of about 415 LTR sites in different countries 
uh, in the European network. As an important part of the Elta service portal, which is dedicated to provide access to sites and data, there are uh, a number of platforms uh, included, which uh, should be mentioned. So the first one is the Dimes SDR, which is the, the, the basic site uh, and data set registry, which is also used on a global scale, providing uh, information on sites for about uh, 1000 long-term sites. Uh, the data integration portal, which is the main discovery and visualization portal uh, in the ELTA context. And moreover, the ELTA central data node, uh, which is a service provided uh, to, the, uh, to the European uh, ELTA community uh, to, to share data as uh, SOS service in this building on the 52 degree north SOS infrastructure. One significant uh, development uh, which takes place now in the Alta Plus project and which also links to the USC uh, activities is building up uh, virtual data labs uh, based on, on Jupyter to ensure uh, reuse uh, of data and code uh, in the community and to support the data analysis. In this aspect, uh, as mentioned before, quality control of the data is an important prerequisite for the integration and reuse of the data in the scientific analysis. The detection uh, of outliers has an important aspect, uh, which we also dealt with in the, in the work uh, of, the, of the competence center. When considering outliers, it's important to separate technical reasons, which result in missing and incorrect values in the observation data. For example, when uh, sensors are covered or there's some uh, uh, some material goes into the to the sample uh, to deviate uh, that from unusual observations which deviate from normal measurements, for example, by high wind speed or high temperature due to uh, very specific climatic situations. So this, this later on are correct values uh, outside the norm. So outlier currently are flagged already uh, during the observation periods or just after or take into account uh, a range of uh, statistical methods to detect idle outliers. Uh, so in this uh, respect, uh, also in the, uh, for the research infrastructure, it's important to standardize them uh, in, uh, in the, um, for, the, for the research infrastructure itself. Um, so this led to the idea uh, of the ELTA uh, Competence Center creating a centralized outlier detection service for the ELTA research infrastructure using EOSC services as underlying infrastructure to support aggregation for standard and standardization of ELTA data products and offer a general quality control service for data providers uh, in the array so they can check the data before submitting them uh, into, the, into the central data store. One specific idea behind the development is to provide a standardized array of outlier detection methods following a non-black uh, box philosophy. So uh, by providing a transparent array of different methods to describe uh, also the use uh, of the this different outlier methods. Uh, this enables uh, also central maintenance of the of the service and thus uh, lowers the usage threshold uh, and providing uh, support and documentation. The idea was to reuse existing methods which are already published by different various R packages, uh, which is one of the of the, 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 the major, major languages used in the community and provide R scripts to perform the basic steps for retrieving the data, accessing them and uh, to the annotation of the outliers and to encapsulate this workflow behind the REST API. The scripts offer a range of commands to retrieve the data either from uh, OGC sensor observation services or from file-based uh, clouds uh, repositories. The advantage uh, of the uh, approach is that outlier detection can offer be both as a service, but also could be implemented locally or offline use uh, if needed. One specific issue uh, is that uh, data provenance is also gaining importance and by using standardized approaches on the methods for the outlier detection as well for the flagging of the data uh, can enhance the traceability and trust uh, into the data and the related data products and analysis. 
So the idea was to encapsulate the R scripts, uh, which partly were existing before behind uh, a REST API. We used uh, the open API specification, uh, which is an approach to standardized REST APIs. It's based on JSON or YAML descriptions of the functions of the REST API. Uh, and the idea is to use the standardized uh, descriptions to automatically generate server stops for many different platforms. So in our case, we used uh, uh, a framework to automatically create Python-based web server. Uh, and there is also an online uh, web editor uh, available, but it also, uh, which also can be used, but not have to, uh, uh, to be used for the, for the, the development of the descriptions. Uh, in addition, auto-generated documentation uh, is also provided for the, for the API. Basically, uh, four uh, uh, um, functions were, uh, were provided, uh, two for the retrieval of the, of the data, which is one for the, for the uh, sensor-based uh, data provision, uh, and the other one for file-based data provision, where the different parameters uh, can be uh, posted uh, to, the, to the web service. Uh, and regarding uh, the analysis, uh, there was uh, one uh, doing a synchronized uh, procedure where you can wait for the, for the result. Um, and the other one uh, is a, a non-blocking or uns unsynchronous uh, case uh, to, to trigger uh, the processing, uh, which is waiting until it's, uh, it's ended. Uh, here you see a, a very simple diagram of the of the service uh, where the, the, the caller uh, is calling the, the web service which constantly runs uh, and each request uh, triggers a virtual R script environment uh, which starts to retrieve, process uh, and annotate the data uh, and performs the outlier detection methods and returns uh, the results. Uh, in the synchronous uh, application, uh, it uh, waits until the information uh, is processed, uh, is available until the next uh, process can be uh, started. Parallel to this, uh, we also um, implemented an asynchronous uh, implementation uh, because uh, the, especially the, the outlier detection methods implemented in R uh, will take uh, some time. Uh, so the, the web server creates, uh, runs the, the R script, uh, creates <clears throat> an information on the status of the, of the process, runs until uh, the annotation is done, uh, and uh, the, the status of the process uh, can be called uh, in between, uh, and basically uh, new, uh, new uh, services can be triggered uh, when needed. For the outlier uh, detection methods, uh, we selected uh, existing univariate, uh, univariate uh, methods uh, using R packages, uh, which apply a moving window approach. And that was uh, one of the uh, performance issues uh, and information on the size of the window and the interval of the outlier detection uh, can be set and uh, passed uh, to, the, to the web service. Currently nine different methods uh, are used, uh, which are called all together. Uh, so there is currently no specific uh, method uh, or parameter to select a specific method, uh, but they are called all at a time. Uh, and you, we get a unique flag for each of the, the nine methods. Uh, so we can, uh, outliers, for example, can be identified by one method, but not uh, by the other. The selection of the, the methods for the, for the outlier uh, detection is still work in progress. progress and will be continued uh, in the Alta Plus uh, project, yeah. also defining a standard set of methods for selected variables uh, needed. So the, the result uh, currently is provided uh, as, a, as a zip file, uh, providing all the annotated uh, original data with the, the data quality flags, but it's also providing additional files for further analysis on the different on the results of the different outlier detection methods. Um, what we also do uh, is uh, provide a simple Jupyter notebook to visualize the results and uh, do basic analysis uh, for the user. So it's the source code uh, is provided uh, on a GitHub uh, repository uh, and also 
uh, information and how to use the API uh, and to do some simple analysis. The current setup of the outlier detection service uses uh, components of the EOSC uh, ecosystem for the implementation of the, of the service. This includes virtual machines hosted by EGI, providing the platform to implement the service uh, using Jupyter, also hosted by EGI, to access and visualize the results for the quality control workflows uh, and also UDAT services uh, for cloud-based data storage hosting. And here, especially B2Drop uh, is used for the file-based uh, data retrieval. Uh, and basically what we, what we did is uh, implementing uh, a prototype uh, of, the, uh, of the service. What are the, the, the lessons learned uh, so far? Uh, is, and, and that was one of the, the main reasons uh, for doing uh, this in the, in the Compass Land Center is also uh, to get a deeper understanding of the uh, sensor observation services, uh, is that using a generic web service for calling the sensor observation services triggers an, a, a number of issues uh, as the, the identification of the time series uh, is, cannot be done in a unique way. It's standardized, but there are different ways uh, of implementing it. So it's a configuration dependent and not universally valid uh, approach, uh, which is potentially very problematic uh, for a generic uh, application. Uh, so ded dedicated profiles, and that's uh, currently under revision in the, in the ELTA uh, array, like WaterML uh, should be used uh, for, the, for the research infrastructure in order to provide uh, standardized uh, services. Another issue uh, is the performance issue uh, that by increasing demand and retrieval, uh, that an increasing demand in retrieval and processing time uh, with the number of observations needs to be taken into account. But the retrieval time, and that was uh, our assumption first, and you you see it in the uh, in the graph um, uh, on the on the right side, is that the retrieval time for SOS, which is not very performant, it's two order magnitude lower than the processing time. <clears throat> so the main issue uh, is the time needed to run the quality <clears throat> control, so the outlier detection method, which needs to be further follow up uh, in future. For example aspects of parallelization or reduction of the, of the methods. And also what we already did, this asynchronous retrieval uh, of, the, uh, of the data uh, have to be taken into account uh, and needs to be further uh, developed. Uh, another uh, issue would be uh, the caching of results, uh, which still uh, needs to be considered uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So where we are, where we are now, uh, and what is the what is the outlook? The Elta <coughs> CC showcased uh, the implementation of a cloud-based web service for outlier analysis uh, for environmental observation using OGC SOS services and data files, uh, and this basically was just a, a first step in the in the development uh, for also for the for the use of the of the Elta infrastructure and as. We can see it now. The service will play an important role for the emerging uh, array and will fit uh, into the workflows of the Elta information system, where it's also important to consider data provenance and enabling uh, fair data. So the, 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 the further work uh, will, uh, will especially focus on the evaluation of uh, additional methods for the, for the outlier detection. So that's a uh, a topical work to be done uh, in the in the Elta context uh, as well uh, as improving the, the performance, uh, for example, in terms of catching, uh, caching, parallelization, uh, and uh, in this kind of things that will be uh, crucial uh, in the uh, in the future. So with that, uh, I would like uh, my presentation. Thank you for the understand uh, for your attention, and uh, I'm open to any questions. Uh, we can, uh, if you have one. Many thanks. Thank you. I don't see questions in the chat window. Any question from the audience? Yes. 
My, my question is about the fairness of data. Did you consider how the fair principles can be implemented around these um, web services that you have piloted? Uh, yeah, we, we are basically we are uh, just at the at the beginning. There are uh, different issues, for example, like uh, also for persistent identification, which is a, a tricky thing when uh, dealing with the uh, with sensor observation services as they are uh, dynamic data. Uh, so that was was uh, considered. Uh, we have an, a, a link to another project uh, or another activity which was done. Uh, in the in the entrefer context, uh, where uh, by using a, a a provenance templating service, for example, this uh, the the information of what happened, so tracking uh, what was done uh, with the data uh, would be uh, would be implemented. Uh, but we are still rather in an in an early phase uh, for regarding that. So that will also be part of the of the other activities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I suggest we move on. Uh, the next speaker is Andrew, who will speak about fusion physics and analytics tools. Yeah, you can see the slides. Uh, hopefully it's full screen now. Yes, no, it's full screen. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so my name's Andrew Layef and um, I'm from the UK Atomic Energy Authority and um, I'm going to be talking about data and computer intensive physics analysis in EOSC. Okay, um, so Begin just to give some background on the research area and the um, computing in this area. So, uh, fusion energy research. So, uh, nuclear fusion is the energy source of the sun and the stars. Um, so, in nuclear fusion, light nuclei fuse together, um, that forming heavier nucleus, and that releases energy. Um, because fusion produces energy, people have been trying for a very long time to recreate fusion on. Earth um, in, as to use it as a source of electricity. Um, so it's quite difficult. What is normally done at the moment is that um, deuterium and tritium are heated to over 100 billion degrees Celsius, and um, that um, causes fusion to take place. Um, of course, the eventual aim for this is to use the energy produced to generate electricity for the grid. Um, this has some benefits compared to alternatives, um, for example, there's no greenhouse gases are produced, and there's um, less long-lived radioactive wastes um, compared to nuclear fission. Uh, so I think computing in fusion, um, I guess one sort of important aspect, maybe compared to other areas, is that there's a very sort of wide variety of um, sort of fields involved and therefore a different wide variety of applications. Um, so it's not just physicists doing, physicists doing simulations or using the same framework. There's people doing plasma modeling. There's uh, materials um, research, engineering, data processing, uncertainty quantification. Uh, people are sort of doing rendium, rendering from CAD models. Um, now people are starting to do um, things like machine learning. Um, so there's a lot of different activities. Um, so in the fusion community today, um, for, first of all, distributed computing essentially doesn't exist, um, apart from the work that we did in EOSC pilots and now in EOSC hub. Um, the sort of data volumes have always been very small, so the scale of computing has also been very small. And because of that, it hasn't really been any type of need for distributed um, computing. Uh, generally, they're just sort of isolated islands of um, data and compute resources. So these are typically HPC facilities that have um, shared storage. Um, so for example, Marconi Fusion at Chenica, um, that's a HPC cluster that's sort of one of the main fusion um, computing facilities um, in Europe. Um, sort of because of this, it can be quite difficult to access data. So 
if you want to access data from an experiment, you need to, in many cases, get access to a specific cluster, which is attached to the storage that holds that data. Um, so also, um, software is typically not portable. Um, sort of extensive use of pre-installed modules, lots of custom software. Um, there's sort of lots um, need to have to sort of make fast specific clusters. So if you want to run a particular application somewhere else, you basically need to fly a developer in to spend a week with you sort of getting it to work. I mean, the last couple of years, it started to improve um, with people starting to move towards containerization, but that's sort of still a small minority. There's also lots of uh, use of commercial software, for example, IDL and commercial libraries and compilers. And even sort of more complex than that is there's lots of software that's um, used for nuclear work that's under US ex export control. So in those cases, it's not possible at all to run them on clouds. And or even it's, it's quite difficult to run them anywhere, in fact. Uh, so historically, the computing infusion has always been at sort of quite a small scale, but it's expected that the um, resource requirements will increase significantly in future. Um, so experiments are starting to produce more and more data. Um, this will particularly happen with um, ITER, um, which will produce around two petabytes of data per day. So that's um, more data in one day than all of all previous fusion experiments um, combined. Um, people are starting to use um, or planning to use different uh, sort of more modern techniques, which may have sort of higher computing requirements, for example, uncertainty and quantification where you're investigating the uncertainty in input parameters um, in a model um, using st statistical techniques. And that sort of requires running the same jobs over and over again with many different param um, the parameters varying. So it has sort of high um, resource requirements. And also things like machine learning and deep learning are starting to um, be used as well. Also have um, increasing memory requirements. So um, the sort of meshes used in the modeling are starting to get larger and more detailed um, in order to produce more accurate results. So that sort of leads to more and more memory being needed. There's also reducing shot time for intershot analysis. So um, this is the sort of data processing that takes place between each shot in the fusion experiment. Um, this time is sort of decreasing plus people want to be able to do calculations with higher and higher fidelity. So that requires sort of more computing power in sort of smaller time periods. And this with ITER will, for example, is expected to run here continuously. So that's the sort of end um, situation. So in the fusion competence center, the aim of the um, center is to investigate whether the services provided by EOSC are suitable for fusion use cases. Uh, there are two parts um, to the competence center, each sort of roughly driven by the expected needs of ITER. And um, there's a storage section, which um, is basically about repli um, replicating data across um, multiple sites and then being able to access um, this data from the different um, computing resources. And it's also then the computes parts um, to the project. Um, this is so that normally in Fusion, I guess the facilities, the local resources are not provisioned to sort of for peak demand. So it's important to be able to sort of burst onto external resources when you need to um, for when you have strict deadlines or this um, work that needs to be done, but it's not something that needs to be sort of run continuously. And we sort of need also need the ability to be able to run workflows across multiple sites. But I'll, but I'll go through these um, two sections in more detail now. Uh, so um, the storage, um, the basic idea is that um, experiment data will be written into a nearby storage system, and then it'll be automatically replicated to other sites um, around Europe or around the world. And then there'll be workflows running on various computes clusters, which will then be able to access the data from um, a near, the nearest storage system or another one if the nearest is unavailable for some reason. Um, so we had a sort of list of uh, requirements. So some of them, for example, included this replication to define sites, um, being able to access the data via standard protocols like via POSIX file system access or HTTP or S3, 
um, wanted automat automated integrity checking with self-healing, uh, globally unique resolvable uh, and persistent identifiers, um, the ability to find the best replica, for example, with nearest replica or one with the lowest latency, and the ability to attach metadata. Um, so we evaluated um, two storage technologies that were available in EOSC, um, which could potentially meet these criteria, um, B2Safe and OneData. Uh, so for B2Safe, we used um, existing deployments at STFC, Chinica, and uh, Poznan. And one data, we didn't actually have access to any existing sort of production deployment. So we um, just deployed our own one providers, which actually simplified things a lot because we could just do everything ourselves. Interestingly, with both of these technologies, they don't provide a way to sort of automatically find the um, best replica. That seems to be something that's sort of left for users to deal with um, themselves. Um, on the compute side, um, so we wanted to demonstrate that we can run containerized fusion applications um, on EOS computing resources, as in clouds. Um, and more specifically, we wanted to be able to run workflows just rather than individual jobs, and in particular workflows that require access to input data and need to be able to write output data back as well. Um, so for doing this, the platform um, that we use needs to be able to support uh, multiple clouds simultaneously. Um, this is sort of quite critical to us. For the competence center, we were given access to two sites in EGI Fed Cloud, and we also had opportunistic access to around five clouds in total from Fed Cloud, uh, as well as a sort of a couple of um, clouds in the UK. So, and it's sort of becoming more and more common to have needs to be given allocations on more than one cloud, not just a single cloud. And we also had sort of very varying job um, resource requirements. So some jobs need single cores and the small amounts of memory, whereas other jobs might require very large numbers of cores and or even multiple nodes at the same time. Uh, so we evaluated some of the options available in EOSC, um, but they didn't seem to meet our requirements. They were sort of mainly aimed at running jobs or workflows on a single cloud, whereas we needed to use multiple clouds. Um, and because we're sort of mainly aiming to use clouds when the results, uh, local resources are full rather than using them continuously, and this sort of means our, require, our resource requirements on clouds can vary quite significantly. So one day we might not need any clouds, the next day one cloud might be enough, and then a few hours later we might need to have as many clouds as possible. And sort of many of the existing solutions don't sort of take care of that situation. Uh, so because of that, we decided on using a platform that we had previously developed in EOS Pilot, which is called Prominence. Uh, so Prominence um, sort of provides a simple batch system type interface to users and completely hides the fact that clouds are used, um, but it automatically distributes jobs across um, any number of clouds and it can use clouds very dynamically. So including scaling um, from to and from zero, which sort of meets our requirements for this project. Uh, so now look at one of the example workflows that um, we were looking at. This is um, for the uh, interstop processing in Fusion. So interstop analysis or processing, processing is the um, automated processing that happens between each um, plasma pulse or shot in the experiment. Uh, this needs to be done as quickly as possible. It's not sort of operations critical, but it, it's quite helpful if it can be done um, as fast as possible. Um, so as an example, the diagram on the right hand side shows the um, sort of an outline of part of the MAST interstop processing workflow. So this is, MAST is um, one of the experiments in the UK. Um, we'd originally intended on running workflows like that across multiple clouds, but because of its sort of heavy, heavily dependence on IDL, that turned out to be not possible. Um, so we had to sort of find alternatives. Uh, so West is a tokamak in the south in France. Um, so we're just looking at one sort of simple example code from the interstop proce inter processing workflow, which is calculation of the plasma equilibrium. So this is the states when all the forces in the plasma are balanced. And um, so for this, we developed a new 
uh, that produced our workflow in Python, which uses the ITER integrated modeling analysis, analysis suite called IMAS. Um, so it's sort of that's the um, framework that's going to be used for ITER um, analysis. And because this is a MapReduce style workflow, um, this enables us to be able to calculate results with high fidelity in a shorter time period by if we can distribute the work across um, sort of more and more resources. Each job then needs to be able to sort of access or read in input data and write its output data. Um, we would, for this, we're looking at using uh, one data. So, this, we'll just try the diagram here shows sort of the basic architecture of how we were able to run this workflow across multiple um, clouds from EOSC. Um, the work, we have created the workflow which was submitted to prominence. Um, prominence then is able to distribute all the work across the different clouds um, that it has access to. Um, for one data, we had a one data provider in the UK, another one in France um, that were connected to on the one zone provided by EGI Data Hub. And, be, and because the two date one data providers were connected to the same one zone, um, that all the data was replicated um, automatically as needed. Uh, so we're able to successfully run this workflow across five um, EGI Fed Cloud sites. Um, this works quite well. Um, the little table there shows the sort of decrease in the processing job all time as the number of processes increases, which is what we'd expect. At the moment, we're just using a sort of toy model, but for sort of more realistic work, the run times would be much more significant. So the ability to be able to run this across sort of more and more resources, it sort of becomes um, sort of more and more useful. So some interesting things we found is that um, so we could access the data from one data um, using direct reads, where we just directly read from one data or copy to the local disk first. Um, the advantage of copying to the local disk first meant that the distance from the one provider was less critical. So we could um, that sort of made things simpler. So you could just access a single um, storage system and have sort of relatively similar performance. If we sort of read directly from one data, that turned out to be much slower when you're sort of further from the one data provider. Um, in terms of impact, um, unfortunately, the impact is currently low. Um, data volumes in Fusion are still quite small. And because of that, the computing scale is still very small. Um, this scale is that sort of definitely sort of more and more likely to grow in size significantly over the next five to 10 years, especially since it will have the first plasma, hopefully about five years or so. Um, so people need to start preparing for that. Plus people have lots of other plans for doing work, work which will have more significant computing requirements, but so they will sort of hopefully come to fruition soon. We did have interest from outside of Fusion. So we had a um, couple of invited talks, um, plus we gave talks at other um, conference, uh, international conferences as well. In terms of future plans beyond EOSC Hub, um, we're going to continue to work on the West use case um, and demonstrate it in being used in production. Um, so far we have a simple model, but that's going to be extended to be more complex and realistic. So being able to run it on clouds will be a sort of much more important performance gains. We also have some more sensitive quantification work being done at uh, UK AA um, using a platform that uses prominence as the back end. So there's sort of similar technology being used for this as we used in the competence center. Um, so that would be another good use case. Plus in EGI ACE, um, the fusion, there's a fusion use case of validating models, um, simulations with experimental data um, using AI. And that's going to also share um, some of the similar services we used in this competence center, but will also include more HPC and um, machine learning. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm conscious of the time, so I suggest to move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, the last speaker is um, Inge Mar from the ESCOT organization. Unfortunately, we, we will eat into your afternoon break, but I hope that's OK. We can see your screen. 
Yes. No. Oh, wrong. <laughs> Slide. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I, I will. You hear me? Yes. I I will talk yes. about uh, give presentation about ISCI 3D Competence Center that we've been running on the EOS Cub for th three years now, almost. Uh, the, the, this competence center is, is of course driven by ISCET, which is Ingmar and uh, me and, and Carl Fredrik. And we have also help from, from the direct developers, Andre and Andri at CNS, CNRS, and uh, also Ari from CSC. So ISCET 3D has. I should just present ISCI 3D first a little for you. Uh, so ISCI 3, 3D is a new concept of radar that we have start, we are developing now at, at ISCI. We, we have been running radars for 40 years, but with this new radar, it, we, we, the, the amount of data that is going through the system will increase quite significant, significantly. So instead of having one beam from each from from the radar, we will we will have hundred beams simultaneously. So we, we are probing the atmosphere mainly, but we are with the ISCA TD we will also see the atmosphere and also further into the near Earth space. And so we have currently we have got just a simple uh, just a, the first article of, of of the antenna unit. And also some equipment inside. So, and with that, we we we, we are then checking, or we are then developing our our software and control software for, for, for the full radar. In the corner here, you can see the the sky map that we have been recording with this one, so we can see that some stars and Milky Way and the sun in the down in the corner here. It's rather broad beam. Uh, so I ask three D is. Uh, Okay, stage one, you should say. So stage one of ISCA 3D is, is consists of three sites in the northern Europe. So we will have, we will have the full the, the core sites in 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 Schiebotten in in Norway and two with transmitter and receiver and two receivers, one in in Finland and one in in Sweden. Then, and we we plan to be fully operational. At least, uh, sometimes, sometime 2023, we, we, we would get the first data end of 2022, I think. Uh, so this is how we, the she button site will look like. So we have made some preparation for the ground, and and the site will look will, will look like this on, on, on in this scale. So the, the, there's the central core, and then we have a number of outliers along some roads here, existing roads or new roads that they have been building. Uh, so I, the ISCI 3D Competence Center was built, was, was constructed for to look what to deploy and integrate the, the tools that we need for 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 the for the workflow services and. For, for the workflow of, of services and infrastructure, and also for the infrastructure itself. So we have uh, uh, been concentrating on this direct workflow management, which is uh, as an integration component. So that would then act as a signal access point towards the e, also the e, e infrastructures, and we, we also count ISCAT as one e infrastructure. Uh, and we will be a plan to use the, the beta services for EODOT, and we have looked at that as well for for for, the, for some levels of the data, and for also for some some access of the data. And we we, we have we have been using. At least we we we. we we plan to to look at several solutions of the of the users user authentication, and we have B two B two access and also the EG check in. Then we need this access 
uh, author access and authority for 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 accessing different levels of data so the level one data which is the lowest levels of data we it's it's raw voltages from the from the radar as I, that is sensitive data in in that respect that we with the radar we we see also things that we are not supposed to see so we see activities of of or secret satellites and so so that data is closed within IceGate more or less some of the data will be cleared eventually and released also for the users level two data is the spectral data where we have integrated data and then lost lost part of the information from this from the from the satellites and so we integrate some some in, in both in time and in rain in, in volume that data will it, it will be embargoed so that is be accessed only by the members of the association then there are, there are different numbers of this embargo embargo times and the level three data which is the the the, the, the physical parameters that are that we will uh, provide for the users the the, the 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 time from level one to level three is a couple of seconds so that is the, the, we will re release open data at, almost at once from 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 the from from the reception of, of the echo so mainly it's the atmospheric parameters but we also of course look at our other atmosphere meteors space debris is rather popular nowadays Yes, on this map you can see who who is members right now. So we have the Nordic countries, UK and China and Japan. Uh, the ISCAT workflow, it says data flow here. So it's mainly the data flow that is we have, we have been looking for the looking at on the in the competence center. But we, there are other workflows. We have the operational workflow also within ISCAT. So when the user is requesting time for a for a, for an experiment, he, he needs to be authenticated and and also authorized to do this. And and then we have a workflow how that request is then scheduled for the radars and then executed and eventually the data will land in the archive. And in the archive we, we, the, the, the data the, the the data workflow takes starts so there are and we have been so you then the things you see here on this slide here is different techniques that we've been looking at we'll be able to look at dcash ruccio depending on this it, it depends also something about what kind of e infrastructure we, we are going to use so we, we, we are planning for both of these both of these techniques and it, and we have the Dirac web in in the center part here. We, we have we have almost gone now for for the EG check in, which is the the, the for, for the authentication. And as I said, we B to find is 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 for 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 the searching. And 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 after of the searching, the, you, the the data from from the out for 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 the process data will also land in the B to share. That, that was our plan. So we have been looking at that. We we have not integrated everything yet together with Dirac, but we at these parts that we are planning to add for the for the, in in the coming projects and also. But we, we so we 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 are, we are rather open, but we we have the the, the toolbox the, the the different boxes rather clearly. We have been doing uh, submitting jobs via a sandbox like this, and all uh, or via the via the uh, a notebook interfaces. So. This is a summary of this and so we have the, the rack file, file catalog which is the central part on the lower level of data the the b to share has the higher level data that it's the 
the the analyze all the, the derived data or the products data products uh, the job submission we have been testing currently on CSC, but we have also been running it on our own containers. And this is how some such a file looks like. The, the, anyone can access iSkit data, so anyone can be a member of the iSkit view. It, we, uh, so we have used uh, the Perun to, to manage the users and so that, that means we don't need to manage the users at, uh, in a way. So, uh, so and we, uh, as for a member being member of the ISKIT view, he, he can access all open data then. Then we have the, for the embargo data, we need to set up groups like this. So we have each member then is, will be one group and the group the groups ourselves they are managed by the members so ask it itself will not manage the group the users quite so much we, there are some groups that are belonging to i get some like system developers and but otherwise we have the the members like the dlr su from germany we have finland is the, the full country really that is from the Somen Academia in, in Finland, for example, and so on. So with these divisions, we, we, we hope we are not overwhelmed by managing users at Icegate at least. The Jupyter Lab, we have an instance at, at EG Jupyter Hub, but we have also a known instance of, of the Jupyter Lab, of course. So a, 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 a lot part of the, the, uh, the operation of it will be done using Jupyter Notebooks. And, and at least for, 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 the, for the users here, we, we, are, we, have, we have developed a, a notebook to, to run the some software this goes this is called the rtg which is the real-time graph normally we run the you have to that is run via a GUI, but on the, this in this uh Jupyter lab we, we have been forced to develop a number of user scripts to for users then because the the, the, the user interface is not so developed there yet uh, yes, and we have not really solved yet how to integrate this directly with with Dirac. So the, the data should then flow directly into the notebook from 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 the Dirac, or vice versa. You should be able to access the data through, through APIs here on the in the in the in the toolboxes. Uh, so when the, the since the ISCAT system already, we will have quite large of compute and storage resources ourselves. So we, 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 when we run the, the radar in full full mode, we, which is not so, we, we don't have funding to run more than 10% of the time with, with full power. But for, for that, we need quite a lot of resources. We need at least, more, at least 100 teraflops and at least 20 petabytes of storage to do this. And of course, during low power periods, the, 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 these resources are available, should be available for, for the users then. So in, in a way, so in a way, IceKit is also one provider of, 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 the, of resources for, for, for users, almost like a research infrastructure or an e-infrastructure in that case. So, and since Icegit is running this ourselves, it, it's, it's also secure sustainability in a way. So we don't have, we don't rely fully on which, which e infrastructure we are connected to. So we will have application platform for analysis. We will also have a platform for, for searches and notebooks that is, 
at the minimum plan that they have now. But of course, we, we are integrating these also to federations with, with the mirror, mirror storages and also mirror applications. So we, all these applications will also be available on the on the federation federated storages. But we, for this, we are then looking at this how to transfer data between these. We are we have this root root or decache. Uh, we, we are also planning for a, a one mirror in the Far East since we have so many members from from the Far East, China, Japan, and South Korea. So in AGAs, we have a, a use case. But we are part of one, one use case between AG and the Chinese NIC, where we will look at also sharing data. There is a similar data built up in, in China currently. And so we will, we will see how we can interact with that as well. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ingemar. Um, for the sake of uh, time, I'm afraid we have to disconnect now because the next session is starting the preparation. If there is any burning question, I didn't see that in the chat window. But if anybody wants to ask a question now, there is one more minute. I don't see raised hands. So thank you, Ingemar, and thank you, everyone, who stayed until the last minute. Thanks for all the speakers. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye.